que de alguna forma es Imágenes uh, Classical Reception in the Visual and Performing Arts. Para nosotros es un placer darte la bienvenida y hacer una puntualización. El título ha cambiado ligeramente, eh, no desde el punto de vista temático, pero sí del acercamiento al tema. Eh, el nuevo título es Conditionally Heroic, Arminius Herman as a Cultural Virus. <laughs> oh dear. It's still time to leave, you know. Um, Ante todo, quiero agradecer la invitación a esta conferencia y la cordial acogida, así como ofrecer mis disculpas para hacer mi presentación en inglés. There is a reason why I have to do this in English, apparently. Um, when Antonio asked me to present on Armenia's in a conference on classical heroes in the modern imagination, I thought, well, now I have a problem. Arminius doesn't count for various reasons, um, because um, he fought against his own people. He had no sustainable success. He didn't have unanimous admiration. He was even killed by his own people. And um, he's not even a national German hero, I'd say. He's a historical protagonist, maybe an icon or a projection for some. But is that enough to make him a national hero? And my answer is, in a way, he is a bit like a cultural virus and can be a hero for some, but even calling him a German national hero is a gross oversimplification. And when I heard that Alain Schnapp wouldn't present, I was even more nervous because I had banking on the fact that he would do the historical introduction. Um, so um, I introduced this last night. Um, I'm not going to repeat everything that, for example, Martin Winkler did, tracing the whole historical progress of the Herman reception. Instead, I want to use Arminius as an example to get an idea why heroes are created, how they can be successful, and how they can vanish. And I'm going to do that based on cultural virus theory and mimetic theory. I know this is what you have been dying to do um, right after breakfast, but I'm sorry, this is what I have to offer. Um, I don't expect you to read all of this, but this is what made me nervous when I uh, returned from the Freiburg Research Center, because this is uh, their definition of a hero. And I'm going to um, take these four steps to introduce you to the idea why he's only conditionally heroic. The first part is just to remind you of a few details about the classical tradition. The second part is on the cultural ecosystem, though the conditions under which a hero could thrive in a certain cultural environment, and I'm focusing on Germany, but not exclusively so. The third bit is how the Herman virus actually spreads. And the third, uh, the fourth part is on how he can be restrained. You know, a, a bit like a certain virus we are not talking about, we, because we have heard enough about it um, over the last couple of years. Um, so this is my plan um, to do here. It's going to be about 30 minutes because I'm covering for Alain as well, so please bear with me. Um, so is Arminius, Arminius the Karuskian an ancient hero? First, um, people are slightly baffled by who the Karuskian are, so let's just make a very short recap. The Karuski are first mentioned by Julius Caesar as being the people living between um, well, the rivers Ems, Weser and the Harz Mountains, so basically the middle north of what is nowadays Germany. They seem to be prone to internal struggles, which eases their defeat by the Romans under Claudius Drusus and the later Emperor Tiberius. And at the start of the first century AD, they are in a dangerous in-between situation, partly pro-Roman, partly anti-Roman. Um, and they are led by a guy called Sigimerus or Segimerus, even that one is unsure. He has a couple of sons, among them Flavus and Arminius. And Arminius and Flavus enter the Roman army. Probably Arminius commands an auxiliary unit. We don't really know. Then it would have been a, an auxilia made of other Germanic tribe members. All of this is extremely vague because, um, well, we even are not sure about the names. Um, certainly Arminius wasn't called Arminius at birth. Um, quite possibly I've just given you the wrong Segimerus because there are three options for him. Um, and even all of the motivation about the early Arminius is guesswork. And I'm going to argue that this makes him very good as a cultural virus, but very bad as a hero. Um, the Roman sources are a bit more reliable when it comes to his later um, career, which brought him citizenship and rank into the equestrian um, order. 
So he starts out as a friend of Rome, but only later turns on to a foe. First, he fights for the Romans, mainly in the north, so against other Germanic enemies of Rome, but also on the Balkan. And then he becomes associated with Quintilius Varus. Um, and I don't tell you about Quintilius Varus and everything else. So Aminius, just to recap, plans a mutiny and revolt. But part of his own family informs Varus about this, or of his kinsmen. Um, and Varus ignores the faction, so um, Arminius is capable of leading a trap attack of conspirators, vanquishing the better part of three legions at the Teutburg Forest. And no, I don't know where the Teutburg Forest is, nobody does, and um, this is part of the attractiveness as a virus again. Um, the Roman tradition is not so much interested, to be honest, in Arminius. They're interested in the defeat, in the effect it has, for example, um, on the Augustian politics or whatever. And this is why I had to put in the Libic card because Marta is sitting next to me. Um, but of course, this also gives you a great sound bite. You know, Augustus banging his head against the door, Quintilius Varus, give me back my allegiance. This is not about a discussion about Arminius um, as any kind of hero. Of course, it is neither in Valeus Paterculus who is more about saving face for the Roman army because it's the greatest army that has ever lived. It only had an incompetent leader in Varus and treacher, uh, treacherous um, allies in the Germanics. Um, the name Arminius is not even mentioned um, in this part of the passage. Um, I'm skipping over Cassius Dio. The more important um, bit is now Tacitus writes um, about a century later. Um, and as he tells, even then, by in his own time, Arminius is largely forgotten by the Greek historians and us in Rome. Um, but he's still sung in tribal lays. We don't hear if the Germanics are actually proud of him or if they just sing about him as a warning example or whatever. We just know he's around. But the Romans have forgotten about him. Tacitus claims, if I wanted to be cynical, there are good reasons to forget Arminius. Well, not just the enormous loss, but also the Romans don't stop. I mean, they keep coming even after the defeat at the Teutburg Forest. They keep coming under Tiberius. They keep coming um, under Germanicus. And when they decide to stop the expansion, it's a decision by the Roman emperor, not because Arminius scared them off. Um, Arminius even is not so successful after 9 AD. He tries to establish various factions, but he doesn't succeed in the long run. And in the end, he is pushing so hard for kingship that his own kinsmen assassinate him. So it's not really an ancient hero, I'd say. So how can he become one? Um, this unlikely rise of um, Arminius, later more familiar as Hermann the German, is of course a modern phenomenon, especially from the 15th and 16th century onwards. So I like to think of it as a cultural ecosystem in which over time a certain idea can spread and then vanish again. Um, and this means I have to introduce to you to um, German history of the early modern age, and this is a nightmare even for somebody who has studied it. Um, the first few centuries, we are dealing with the um, Holy Roman Empire of the German nation. I've just given you the coat of arms to show you how complex it is. There is an idea of being, um, well, kind of linked to ancient Roman Empire by the Translatio Imperi idea. So the Holy Roman Emperor um, of German nation is still the Roman Emperor, but to be honest, in early modern age, his power is very limited. Um, it's not just about a very fragmented political landscape. Um, it's also a very fragmented territorial situation, which with countless exclaves and enclaves, competing dynasties and irregularities. For example, the king of Bohemia and the whole bit on the right, they are direct subject to the Roman emperor. But so are a few villages who are free farmers. So basically they are on the same level. This is something you, you cannot understand if you haven't done it for a couple of centuries. So the whole idea is having a very fragmented cultural ecosystem of very different political alliances, territorial situations, a fragmentation in religious regards, because some of them are Protestant, others are Lutheran, the next one are Catholic, the next ones are Mennonite, the next ones are Jewish. Um, there is a fragmented economic situation and even a fragmentation in languages. The people from the north wouldn't have understood the ones from the south and the ones from the east. So think of it as a cultural ecosystem which provides us with various niches. So room for ideas to thrive in a limited space first, thrive like viruses. And if one is suited well for the conditions, it can spread. 
it can spread to other parts of the empire, it can spread to other minds. And this is more or less the idea behind, behind cultural virality, but also the idea behind mimetic theory. We should not look at the carriers, not look at the humans, we should look at the ideas and think from the perspective of the idea, how do I get replicated? How do I make myself attractive? And of course, the replications of each idea, because ideas only live if they are replicated. They are like viruses. If you don't have a carrier, don't live on. The replications are not perfect and variants will occur all of the time with each time they are replicated, quite often involuntarily. And this means that somebody talking about Herman isn't sure if the same Herman arrives in the mind of the person who is listening. And these variants can be more or less effective. And this means that such a model doesn't need a maker of tradition. Of course, there can be certain influential uh, people. It, is, it is, includes the possibility that somebody purposefully creates a variant and makes it more attractive. But there is a limit. You cannot directly control people's minds. You have no control what they actually understand and what they make of an idea. You can just try to make Armenius more attractive, for example, if you're a nationalist poet. But if people will believe you, it's a whole different issue. Um, so you can try to influence the conditions supporting the replication, you can try to make ideas more attractive, but that is all. So if I say that Armenius becomes more successful towards the end of the Holy Roman Empire, this means that he gets more repetition, usually without a direct steering force, but he's not unanimously accepted as a national hero. And of course, the different variants are successful in different traditions, but also in different groups, in different settings, in different parts of the empire, in different status groups. Um, and of course, all of this is subject to changes. For example, when um, the French arrive under Napoleon, the cultural system changes up to a point. So the conditions under which the Herman virus gets replicated change. And um, if you think about how Herman starts spreading, this is among the humanists. Why? Because they're discussing with their Italian and French colleagues and they are bothered by the fact that they have no long-standing Germanic tradition like the French and the Italians do. So they are looking for a common cultural German heritage. This is the first bit. And the second one, they need something that is attested in an authority such as Tacitus. So Herman is more or less basic option. If at the same time in the 15th century, when humanists were talking about Herman excitedly, if at the same time you had asked the people who actually lived in the territory where the Karaski once lived, nobody would have even known about Herman. So it's a virus that spreads, for example, in a learned community quicker and also in an intellectual discourse more quickly than it does in the rest of the empire. Again, this seems pretty basic, but it helps to not just think about the hero, under the terms of the carrier, but of the idea, how does he now get attractive? Um, and all of this fragmented ecosystem, which I've shown you, um, goes on far into the 19th century, sometimes even after the breakup of the Holy Roman Empire. There is a united German Empire in 1871, but it in excludes many parts which were considered off German nation. And so it's hardly surprising that um, Herman the German um, gets popular in the extremely diverse Southwest, where ex uh, particularly a class of educated upper, upper middle class people are looking for unifying nationalism in, as a driving force. They are looking to unite the nation under a certain idea. And they're doing so first in, for example, political festivals, but also in the March Revolution, the Frankfurt Parliament, again, carried by educated middle classes, upper middle classes, usually in cities, often tolerated by lower classes and opposed by the upper classes who were not so much interested in unifying cultural heroics. And this also explains why the Herman virus spreads in certain media quicker than it does in others. Because he is easily adaptable to media which are popular with the so-called Bürger class. The Bürger are the educated upper middle class in cities and they are very much interested, for example, in dramatic poetry or in historical novels. So the Herman virus is adapted there and he's successful because he offers a lot of story elements that work well in dramatic poetry or in historical um, novels. 
but also in historical paintings, which used to be something of the upper class, but now becomes a focus for the upper middle class. Or in board games, I had to do board games. I'm sorry, I spent the last week, I did a Victoria just researching board games, so I had to include them somehow. Um, and you can see them as a method of edutainment for the upper middle classes. So they include the Germanics as well to establish a certain idea of an eternal history that they can relate to. Um, and of course, Arminius enters now this canon of knowledge, but he's not the only one. I mean, if you can see this, the, the slide is a bit bright, um, but these are four great minds of the historical portrait lotto. And you can see that, um, for example, the first one is Homer, the second one is Arminius, the third one is Rudolf of Habsburg, and the fourth one is Frederick the Great. So he comes into this canon of knowledge, he is one of many options, and he's usually the classical Germanic option combined with the veneration for a Greek option. Um, but not everybody um, sees it the same way. For example, you can have different constructions of this kind of virus adaptation. Um, and in this case, you have kind of a perfect line of history, how it should develop. And now Arminius becomes part of this, part of a certain narration, and he gets more Germanized, you might say, because this is the time when also the translation as Hermann becomes more popular. It has been around since the times of Martin Luther. But it's only in the 19th century that people look for a Germanic hero that actually has a German, not a Latin name. So again, because we don't know the real name of Arminius, it makes it easier to adapt him to that. But if I say he's not a unanimous national hero, just to give you one example, this is one of many, many free states in the so-called unified empire of 1871. I chose Oldenburg because I lived there once, but also because it's a good example. <coughs> of course, they knew about Arminius. He was taught about at school, for example, but he wasn't a national hero because the Oldenburgians were very proud of being, yes, German, but mainly Oldenburgian. So they were interested in local heroes and they erected monuments to the ancient Frisians. Unfortunately, the Frisians are not part of the revolt. So they mainly ignored Arminius related to the ancient Frisians, to the Frisians also in the time of Charlemagne, to the Frisians in the 13th and 14th century. And the whole idea is that you construct your own local, ancient, medieval, early modern history and identity with a different kind of adaptation of sources and of available, you might say, cultural viruses, the so-called free Frisian idea. Um, and Oldenburg also controlled a tiny bit in the southwest. This is called um, the Duchy of Birkenfeld, and they didn't like Arminius either. Why? Because they wanted to split away from Oldenburg. So they emphasized the fact that they are not about national unity when they broke away in 1919. They were now an independent republic. So Arminius is around as an idea, but this doesn't mean that he is a unanimously accepted national hero everywhere in every time in every social status group. Um, so how does it actually work if he is successful? Um, the first few examples I gave you just were there to illustrate the complexity and the inconsistency of all of these conditions under which he gets replicated. So if I told you that, for example, the Bürger social status group aspired to a certain unifying nationalism, they also aspired to higher education. They venerated Roman culture. They also venerated local traditions and the Holy Roman Empire ideology. And Arminius, again, in this setup is not without alternatives. This is from another game where he is introduced as one of the great heroes of history. And you can see him placed between Hannibal and Geoffrey of Bouillon, which is kind of an odd thing to do for a German. Um, but again, because he is just one of many available options. Um, and even if you look at strictly Germanic German connections, he's not the only one. This is from a different game where we have Odoacar as an alternative, because he is the creator, and I quote, of the new world who raised from the ruins of the Roman Empire a world through Germanicism and Christendom. Okay, um, this is even difficult to explain, it's even more difficult to get your head around this. Um, 
This is why mimetic theory and cultural wider theory suggests not to look at how people understood this, but how this kind of information, this kind of cultural wires could be adapted by as many people as possible, under which conditions, how it became attractive to a variety of people, and how it created qualities that increased the likelihood of replication. And of course, Herman is not just one cultural virus or one meme. You might even argue that he's not really a cultural virus, he's more of a meme, an idea, or a complex of ideas, a combination. And this is what mimetic theory suggests, that you think of a combination of ideas, they form a memeplex, and this memeplex can be Herman is a liberator, Herman is a defender, Herman is a loving husband, and all of this combined makes it more likely to talk about Herman, so that he gets replicated in people's minds. And of course, um, this kind of replication doesn't work in a completely restricted setting. We are not an island. So these cultural ecosystems can interact with other cultural ecosystems, for example, Germany and France. So if you see the pair of Versigetorix and Arminius, um, it makes it clear why both are attractive. Both are um, defenders against Roman expansion. Both are liberators up to a certain part um, from provincialization. But the Germans now can claim that Arminius was better because, you know, most of Germany didn't become Roman. Um, but this is one way to make this whole idea attractive, to be in an opposition against France. And this has nothing to do with the original idea what Herman was about, but it has something to do with a comparison of ideas. One works better than the other. And you can even use this transference way, way further. Take the Hermannschlacht. This is a silent movie from 1922-1924. It started out as a simply nationalist movie on Hermann the German in 1922. And then came the French occupation of the Ruhr country. They changed the script and now Hermann doesn't fight the Romans, he fights the Gauls. At least he fights the Romans, but they are called Gaul in character. You know, so he has turned the Romans into Gauls because you can better explain it, make it more attractive to an audience who is now hostile to France. Um, or you can take this further because, not just because you have the comparison with France, but also because you see yourself as by that time mainly a Protestant nation and France is a Catholic nation. And so you can use something that has been around since the late 19, uh, 1890s, the idea of Herman as a Protestant hero. And so it works against France as well, but it still works in a religious setting. And you can see how absurd this can be. Herman can be adapted by carrying a shield with Vicky on it. So a quotation from, from Julius Caesar, I have one, and Martin Luther, I don't know if you can read that, has a Bible saying, Winkum, I'm going to win. And so the whole idea is opposing um, two national heroes into one. The idea is this is German. Being German is being Protestant, being a defender, but also being a rigid, uh, religious Protestant, um, being a reformer. And you can see how adaptable um, Hermann becomes in this tradition. And this, of course, makes it easier to turn him, for example, into an anti-French, anti-Catholic hero as well. So what are the qualities that make the Herman virus um, particularly attractive? Well, the first simple thing is we know his name and we know a place that is linked to him because it's much easier to talk about a person if you know what he is named. And 99.9% .9 of all ancient Germanic tribe members are unnamed to us. So basically, if we know about Herman, we can talk about it. But also, if we know about the Teutobuk Forest, and this is brilliant that we don't know where exactly the Teutobuk Forest is, because for a certain time in German history, this made it easier to acquire the Herman virus because you were looking for the Teutobuk Forest at your own doorstep. There are over 100 places in Germany which claimed to be the Teutobuk Forest. And it worked because people could now say he's our local hero as well. It happened right next door. And this one is from the forest, which is nowadays called Teutobuk Forest, but it was renamed in the 19th century because they wanted to be the number one Teutobuk Forest. 
you know, and by now we know that he didn't fight the battle there, but they are still named the Teutburg Forest because it's good for tourism. So basically they are still carrying a form of the, the, the Herman virus because the elusiveness of the place, but at the same time knowing that there is a named place makes it easier to use this vagueness to make an attractive virus. It also helps, of course, if you are um, attested in respected sources. Of course, when Suetonius was respected for being the father of biography, and he mentions Arminius, Tacitus respected as the father of historiography, and Arminius is respected there, at least mentioned. This makes it easier, and they deliver good sound bites. Virus, give me back my legions, and without doubt, the liberator of Germany. And this helps in particular if you look at the 19th century, where it is very popular to create reduced translations. You don't translate the whole of Tacitus, you just translate bits and pieces. And then you get the good sound bites and suddenly you have a national hero because you cut off anything negative that Tacitus says. Um, so it helps because it's already around. This is not what Tacitus had in mind, but this is again a variant of the German um, Herman virus. And of course, there are good stories in there. The opposition to his brother Flavus, um, the loving of his bride to Snelda, who gets adopted, etc., etc., etc. It helps that Herman is linked to the enormity of Roman losses. But again, it also helps that he is very vague in other regards. He has negative qualities. He fought his own kinsmen. He get, gets killed by his own family. But we don't know when he fought. We don't know exactly how he was killed. So it can be a bit vague. You can leave it out. And this is how a virus can also work by omitting the negative parts thus making the rest more attractive. So this leaves you with a multitude of attributable motivations. You can make Herman a defender of the homeland, but can also claim that he is a liberator from foreign cultural influence. You can make him an icon of personal motivation, the loving husband or whatever, or you can make him the leader of a democratic unity of tribes, but you can also make him somebody who thrives for a monarchical structure which is more sustainable. He doesn't succeed, but at least he realizes that the Germans need a monarch. Um, and all of this brings us back to the question of intentional narrative. Can you really not create this kind of narrative? Well, up to a point you can. You can voluntarily, for example, adjust your own narrative. You cannot believe something and emphasize something else and use the vagueness of, for example, the initial career to invent a story about Herman being a hostage at Rome. So he wasn't voluntarily there. That he fought for the Romans was under duress. You know, he isn't really a Roman soldier. He's just a German who wants to go back home. And of course, there is nothing in the story we have from the ancient sources that prohibits inventing this kind of idea. But you cannot guarantee that others will accept it, replicate it, enforce this idea. So it becomes a variant that includes this, this story about Herman being hostage, but it's not even the most successful one. And for example, if you are talking to people in the north of Germany, it's more important that they have a local connection. He's one of the Coriscans. The Coriscans lived in our region, so I have a personal regional linkage. Um, while in the south, you cannot do anything about local history. You're focusing on the liberator idea. And of course, carriers don't have to be aware of the fact that they are carrying the virus and why they do so. Just to give you one example, this is from Minnesota in the United States. Um, Minnesota um, erected a state monument in 1888, finished in 1897, which is an obvious imitation of the Herman Monument at Detmold, which was completed in 1875. Um, Herman at the time was already losing status as a national icon in Germany, but in the US he was still very popular because he had a lot of German settlers over there who were looking to confirm their identity. The American Civil War had finished, Minnesota had become filthily rich, and so they wanted something to express their heritage, but also their new gained wealth, and they erected a copper statue, which somehow linked them to classical ideas, it's a copper statue, a gigantic copper statue, but it also linked them to German heritage. And of course, it opened it up to ideas of slightly or more racist fraternities who are interested in a strong male white leader. And Herman provided just that. 
you didn't have to reflect it. Not everybody shared the same idea about Hermann, but this is what made it successful. And of course, he's also a symbol for wealth because he is the third largest copper statue in the United States. And when 10,000 people joined the opening um, of the statue, or when nowadays people are celebrating Herman Fest outside of the statue, they don't have to reflect why they do. Um, they don't even have to understand why it's so, so maddening for modern German that they cannot distinguish between Germanic, which is German in antiquity, and German nowadays. They don't have to because the virus is successful through a certain vagueness. And all of this still plays a part, like Krebs and others um, have researched. But cultural viruses need carriers, not informed ones. And you might even argue that informed carriers are a threat because they tend to reflect upon why they retell the story. So um, how can you um, get rid of something like that virus? Why is he almost forgotten nowadays? Um, well, first of all, forgotten is too strong a word. He is still quite locally respected and um, he's familiar to many people, not just um, at Minnesota in New Ulm, where they still do Herman reenactments. Um, he's also, for example, a local um, historical icon. Um, at the Detmold Monument, they dress him up in football jerseys when the local football team plays. Um, so he's kind of a focus for local pride. Not as much because he's Arminius, but because the football club is named Arminia Bielefeld. So basically there is a link in the name. Um, and you can nowadays even write again children's books on Herman the Karaskian, this is from 2009. Um, but you don't hear about him as really a national hero. He's taught about in schools, but only at a very short bit. Um, and even the archaeological park which is at the site where the Battle of the Teutoburg Forest probably took place, has now renamed itself. It used to be called the site of Hermann's battle. It's now called the site of Varus's battle. So he, they kind of got rid of the virus um, and it even uses this in marketing. Um, so we have two main developments that affect the virus since the late 19th century. One, there is better competition sometimes around, which is better adapted to the changing cultural conditions. And the second one is that people develop strategies of immunization against the cultural virus. To give you an example, German, Germany used to be ununited until 1871, became united at least most parts in 1871. At that point, Germany um, did have a national icon, Hermann, who was one to create unity. But he wasn't such a good icon if you had unity. Now they had a monarchy. How can you look up to Hermann, somebody who was assassinated when he tried to become king? So Hermann becomes obsolete as somebody thriving for unity. Because once you have reached unity, you need an actual strong monarch. And he isn't such a good idea in that regard. On the other hand, you have a time in Germany, and this is just from the um, 1930s, but I could have shown you something from the 1890s as well, where racial ideologies thrive. And the idea is to find larger parts of the world as um, regions of cultural identity, to see that um, Indo-Germanic identity is spread all over most of Europe and parts of Asia as well. If you are looking for something like that, and these are the changing conditions, you don't need Hermann. You don't need a single monarch from the first century AD with his semi-mythical um, narrative. And by the way, um, the Nazis didn't have much use for Hermann either because they didn't want um, a leader who got assassinated and Hitler famously, uh, famously favored Spartans. Um, all of that does not mean that the virus gets eliminated right away. It's not that one competition or one factor can eliminate a cultural virus. It's just that you can curtail him, contain him more. Um, for example, still in the 1920s, when Herman started to get unattractive to most people, a few invested heavily into making the Herman film. People thought this was a good commercial idea, doing a Herman blockbuster in, 18, in 1922. 
But at the same time, Fritz Lang thought it would be a good idea to do a Siegfried blockbuster, Die Nibelungen. So basically the two films entered cinemas at the same time and Herman was at a loss. Siegfried dominated by over 100 to one. So basically Siegfried was the more attractive alternative also for artistic reasons because the Herman Schlacht is a really bad film and Die Nibelungen is a really great film. But um, there are various reasons for why a virus gets redacted but not entirely vanishes. There is still a certain filmic tradition of Herman up until the 1970s in Germany, where you can see him portrayed in a blockbuster called Hermann der Karuske. So he is still around. He's just no longer as successful. Um, so it makes replication less likely. Um, and of course, the Herman film also had a different problem. When it came into cinema, it was 1924. This was when the French had already agreed to retreat from the rural country. So if you made a film against the French, but the French were no longer there, this made it difficult to use it as a historical analogy. Also, um, after World War II, there was a situation in which um, a term like Germanic was very loaded in Germany for obvious reasons. So there was one strategy that also worked against the Herman virus, and that was to focus on local tribal history instead of Germanic history. You are now teaching about, for example, the Suabian history, or about the Bavarian heritage, or about the Frankish sites, or the Alemannian origins. And all of this meant that you didn't have to say Germanic, but Herman was still very much linked to the idea of being a Germanic hero, so he just kind of disappeared in these narratives. But it worked up to a point. Ask modern day Bavarians if they believe they are Germanic or descended from the Bayuvarii. They will tell you they are the descendants of the Bayuvarii. It's very much a local tradition that kind of pushed the unifying Germanic virus out. And even sites such as the um, Kalkrise, which is the archaeological park I talked before, um, when they decided to switch their name from the Battle of Hermann to the Battle of Varus, they did something else. They got new merchandise. And it's more than semi-ironic. It's not about venerating the ancient heroes, it's about making self-ironic fun about them. So they have Tusnelda beer and Herman sausages. And this is also kind of an insulation technique, of an immunization technique, you might say. So you can get immune to a national classic hero, and this is probably where the virus analogy could end, um, unless you consider some more recent um, situations, it's not so much popular, this series in Germany, it's more popular abroad. And to a German, it's extremely worrying that Herman is played by an Austrian. Yeah, I know. Um, and Trisnella, by the way, is played by a French. Um, so there's an increasing awareness, I'd say, in Germany nowadays, for, for example, the role of immigrants and mixed history of Germany. So we are basically, more or less, I think, immune to the Herman virus. But as we have learned over the past years with viruses, you never know. So maybe there will be a Herman virus 2.0 sometime in the future. So maybe to be continued. Thank you very much.